General Basilica, this is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Can you hear me? Brian, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Well, thank you, General, for joining us this morning, and good morning to the Pentagon Press Corps. Um, our brief for today is Brigadier General John P. Basilica. Uh, General Basilica is the commander of the 256 uh, Brigade Combat Team, Louisiana National Guard. Uh, this brigade is in the process of completing its deployment uh, in support of Operation Iraqi Fre Freedom, uh, where it's been part of uh, Task Force Baghdad for the past year with the 1st uh, Cav Division uh, initially and now with the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, I had an opportunity to talk to the general yesterday, and I have to tell you the, uh, the accomplishments uh, that that unit has uh, achieved in the last year are uh, tremendous, and they have an awful lot to be proud of. And as we all know, they are coming home to a difficult situation uh, back here in the United States also. Uh, the general would like to uh, start with an overview of, of what his unit has been doing in Iraq, uh, and then we'll take some questions from you. So with that, uh, sir, why don't I turn it over to you? Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for being here, and I appreciate the opportunity to give you an overview about the uh, deployment of the 256th uh, Brigade Combat Team, uh, the Tiger Brigade. Uh, about 18 months ago, the brigade was mobilized for combat in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, the brigade is made up mostly of uh, Louisiana National Guard soldiers, uh, but uh, we were also uh, supplemented with uh, soldiers uh, from the state of New York, uh, mostly infantry from the uh, a very storied unit, the uh, 69th Infantry, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, we also received some soldiers from Minnesota, from Illinois, state of Washington, um, Wisconsin, most notably. Uh, this team was formed uh, in the May time frame of 2004, and uh, it is a unit that is one of the Army's uh, enhanced separate brigades, and as such, we were uh, fortunate to have a uh, degree of additional resources for our training uh, prior to our mobilization. Uh, as a, uh, an enhanced brigade, uh, we were afforded all of the opportunities that most of the active component units receive. Uh, we were afforded the opportunity to go to the National Training Center, which is the premier collective training uh, event for any uh, combat formation. And we trained for that. We received additional resources and monies. We were able to go to uh, additional schools and training. And uh, all of that set the framework and the foundation, I think, for the, <clears throat> the performance uh, that we were able to, uh, to achieve on the battlefield. Uh, when we were mobilized, we received the other units uh, from out of state. Uh, the 69th Infantry uh, is a unit uh, that uh, is from the Manhattan area for the most part. Uh, they are a unit that uh, responded immediately in their state capacity uh, to Ground Zero uh, during 911. Uh, they moved immediately. Most of them uh, spent a year uh, doing that type of uh, service and then turned right around and came to uh, combat uh, with us. Uh, our relationship uh, ironically goes back uh, to the Civil War where we were on the uh, opposite sides of that particular fight. And, uh, but this time we were shoulder to shoulder and uh, those soldiers certainly uh, kept us motivated and reminded us why we were in Iraq and uh, because we were attacked in America and, uh, and we were there to protect and, and take the fight uh, to those that would uh, uh, threaten our security and our freedoms. So uh, with that, uh, we went to Fort Hood. Uh, we spent uh, approximately five months there uh, going through training. Uh, we received all of the latest equipment that the Army had to offer, uh, the very best. Uh, we trained on it. We gained proficiency with it. Uh, we trained together as teams. We cross-attached and became uh, a very, very cohesive unit. And then uh, without uh, any delay and without any difficulties, we had a very smooth uh, deployment into the theater where we were attached initially to the 1st Cavalry Division. Uh, we have been part of uh, Task Force Baghdad uh, for the entire year that we have been here. And uh, our tour has been marked uh, with a uh, great deal of uh, adaptability in that we have had to move around uh, that task force uh, area of responsibility. And uh, in the last 12 months, we have uh, almost 
had responsibility for just about every square inch of battle space uh, west of the Tigris River at some point or another. So we have moved around both in a rural setting and now uh, we are just leaving uh, a very urbanized setting. So the soldiers uh, achieved a, a level of proficiency and competence. Uh, they were very flexible and adapted every, uh, every day uh, to the situations that were uh, presented to them. And again, I think that that was a tribute to the training that we did receive prior to our, our coming. Uh, much of, uh, of what we were able to accomplish, uh, we, we did across what we referred to as all of the lines of operations. Uh, and there are five that we do focus on. Uh, the first is combat operations. Uh, clearly, we were in, a, in some of the most dangerous and hostile area uh, uh, that we operated in in Task Force Baghdad. And we were uh, in some very, very difficult uh, areas when we first arrived. And uh, in just about every case, uh, what we were able to do was provide uh, positive results. Uh, the area that we first uh, deployed into was a, a very rural area, which was a, a place where m uh, most of the enemy forces would cache and stage their attacks. It was a place where they used to fire uh, lots of rockets and mortars uh, as a result of uh, a very aggressive patrolling and, uh, and offensive operations in those areas. Uh, most of that was reduced uh, and uh, had very, very positive results. Uh, we had uh, mostly offensive operations the entire time we have been in the, in the battle space. Uh, we've had over 1,000 uh, suspected insurgents that have been uh, captured. Uh, 500 of them, uh, based on the quality of the work that the soldiers have done in terms of being able to provide the evidence that's necessary uh, to, uh, to retain these suspected terrorists, uh, all of that good work has earned them trips to, uh, to the Abu Ghraib prison where they await trial uh, in the uh, combined, uh, the CCCI, the combined uh, court of a, a criminal court of Iraq. Uh, we have prosecuted uh, almost 10% of those, uh, and uh, we have a very, very high success rate. So these are individuals that have been uh, convicted of these crimes and are uh, now being incarcerated uh, in an Iraqi prison. Uh, in addition, combat operations that uh, we have been successful in terms of raids. Uh, the brigade and, and some of its units were responsible and, and participated in the very, very good story of uh, releasing uh, the Australian hostage, Mr. Wood. Uh, that was certainly a highlight of combat operations for us. Uh, in addition, uh, we have had uh, very good luck in terms of keeping the MSRs open. We are finding about as many of the improvised explosive devices as we are as our detonating. Uh, we have the latest equipment, uh, the Buffalo uh, IED, uh, de uh, counter IED device. Uh, we found over 50 IEDs with that device, so the technology is certainly helping us. And uh, uh, we just have had uh, a lot of momentum, and I would tell you that the, uh, the battle space is clearly a safer place, and, uh, and we do have the insurgency on the run. All of that, uh, clearly the highlight uh, during our period there was the uh, elections in January. We played a, a key role in providing uh, a security in the zone so that the Iraqi people could vote. And they voted in droves. Uh, this has uh, given them the momentum, moved right into the, the uh, formation of the Constitution. And uh, as we leave, uh, we have set conditions for what we are sure to be a very uh, positive uh, referendum on the, uh, on the October 15th. The other uh, line of operation that we're particularly proud of is that we've had a, a, a key role in training Iraqi security forces. Uh, from day one, uh, we've had a partnership with the 1st Iraqi Brigade. Uh, this is the first brigade that has uh, developed to such a point that they now control their own independent battle space in, uh, as part of Task Force Baghdad. Uh, we actually have uh, two brigades that we're working with, the first and the third, and they have had uh, tremendous progress in the year that we have been here such that uh, they control a large segment of the battle space uh, in downtown Baghdad. Uh, they are now uh, producing uh, qualified non-commissioned officers. They have non-commissioned officer education systems. Uh, they are uh, recruiting and training women into their formations. They are very progressive, and uh, we couldn't be prouder of them. They've gone on all of the uh, patrols, and uh, most of the operations that we have been doing since we moved into the urban areas, uh, those have all been combined operations. The next uh, line of operation uh, that we were very successful with is in uh, what we refer to as essential services. Uh, those are uh, what I think uh, we, we understand as sweat projects, uh, sewer, water, electricity, and trash. 
Uh, the brigade during this period there managed over 100 uh, individual projects, uh, $300 million worth of, uh, of work. Uh, this did two things. It put Iraqis to work, uh, and number one, and number two, it also provided uh, improved quality of life uh, for the citizens there uh, in Iraq. Uh, both of those things uh, provided confidence to them that their government was, uh, was beginning to mature and to be able to provide the type of support that they would expect. And again, the Iraqi forces were providing security so that these people uh, could provide these types of services. Last uh, but not least was economic development and governance. Uh, in the uh, urban areas, uh, it, is, it is fairly mature. Uh, the, uh, the, na the neighborhood advisory councils and the district advisory councils are meeting uh, regularly. That was something that they could not do because of the security situation when we first arrived. Now that is no longer a problem. Uh, they are accountable uh, to their uh, citizenry. Uh, they have uh, excellent debates. They hold their public servants accountable, and, uh, and that is now a very, very mature process in the battle space uh, that we have responsibility for. And as far as economic development, uh, we had a very, very uh, successful uh, operation when we were in the rural areas initially uh, to help the farmers uh, restore their agricultural industry. And we provided seed and fertilizer, some expertise, and then a, a large uh, tractor issue with the generators. And that is paying big dividends as the, uh, the agricultural industry and, and our part of uh, the area has now uh, been able to, uh, to improve itself. Uh, so all told, I would tell you that uh, it's been a very eventful uh, 12 months uh, that the 256 has been uh, in the theater. Uh, we are uh, appreciative to the great support that we received from the two active component divisions, the 1st Cavalry and the 3rd Infantry Division uh, during our stay here. And uh, we are very proud of uh, the contributions that we have made uh, to the effort. And uh, we are very, very optimistic about the future uh, for the Iraqi people. Uh, at this point, we are ready to redeploy uh, back to Louisiana. Uh, clearly, uh, the disaster there uh, because of Hurricane Katrina uh, leaves us uh, a, a challenge that we do face. Uh, again, in uh, the irony of, of the uh, relationship that we've had with our, our New York brothers in the 69th, they had a, a catastrophe to deal with before they went to combat. Uh, now we have one that we have to face uh, after combat. Uh, we are more than up to the task. Uh, we are very, very well trained and have uh, fought hurricane uh, before and have uh, performed recovery operations in the past. Uh, this one is on a scale and a scope uh, that we've never seen and there's a, a tremendous amount of suffering that's going on and our hearts go out uh, to our, our uh, fellow citizens in Louisiana. Uh, we are not uh, far away. We're about ready to come home and to lend a hand. We have a significant number of of soldiers in the brigade that are ready to transition from, uh, from this fight to that fight and, uh, and, and hope to provide some relief uh, to the people in Louisiana. Uh, with that, uh, I will uh, turn it back over to Brian and we can begin with uh, some questions. Well, thank you. Let's uh, go ahead and get started here. Uh, Will? Uh, General, this is Will Dunham with Reuters. Can you tell me how many of the soldiers in your brigade are going to be playing a role in disaster relief in Louisiana, and what specific role do you think uh, your brigade is going to be playing in the disaster relief effort? Well, what, uh, what we know right now is, is several things. Uh, the first thing which I believe is very, very important is that um, we've been assured that as we return home uh, that each individual soldier is going to be able to make a choice. Uh, there are going to be those soldiers whose uh, particular life situation is such that he's going to be able to move uh, immediately from uh, a combat situation uh, to a uh, recovery uh, operation. And uh, right now, just with a very, very uh, informal poll of the soldiers, when I've talked to them, out of about uh, 2,500 soldiers, about 800 have indicated that they are uh, interested in serving in some capacity uh, when we return. About 1,500 have said that they are going to go ahead and just come off of uh, active duty and return to their civilian uh, occupations. And then there was about 200 that uh, just did not have enough information uh, to make a, uh, an informed decision. I think that's what characterizes the situation right now. As uh, many of you know, there are a lot of uh, National Guard forces as well as some active component forces that are in Louisiana that are uh, uh, very appreciated and are already serving 
Uh, it'll be up to uh, the Adjutant General of the State of Louisiana, Major General Andrino, uh, to find uh, the best use of the brigade. Uh, we are a very flexible force. I think what we certainly bring to the fight is the fact that we, are, uh, we have a headquarters uh, that has got a large planning staff, uh, a staff that can uh, solve problems, develop solutions to complex problems. Uh, we can uh, command and control large formations, which we did here in combat and uh, both active and reserve. So we're very comfortable doing that. And, and then uh, again, we can sustain ourselves uh, as a force. So uh, we believe that we provide a great deal of flexibility uh, to the Adjutant General, to the Governor, and we'll be prepared to serve in whatever role they feel that we can best uh, make a contribution. May I uh, just uh, follow up briefly? Um, when is the entire unit going to be back home and uh, have some elements of it already uh, returned? Uh, yes, they have. Uh, we had uh, approximately a little over 500 soldiers uh, from the brigade uh, that were uh, negatively affected themselves personally. Uh, those soldiers uh, have been the priority, and we have adjusted the flow of soldiers uh, out of the theater uh, in consideration of them to get them home the soonest. Uh, there are soldiers in Kuwait, as we speak, that are waiting for uh, their transportation back to the United States. There are soldiers that have already arrived in the United States, so we are in the the throes of the redeployment process as we speak, and we've made uh, the necessary adjustments to get the most uh, needy home first, and then provide the, the next group, which would be the ones that we would hope could uh, have volunteered to support, and then we'll flow the rest in. But all of it uh, going in accordance with uh, a, a redeployment process and a structure. Mr. McIntyre. Uh, General Jamie McIntyre from CNN. Have you personally been affected by uh, the disaster in Louisiana? And, and can you also just talk about what's being done uh, to help uh, your soldiers who have uh, suffered either the loss of, of uh, property or homes or, or even perhaps still have missing loved ones? Uh, yeah, first of all, let me just say that uh, personally, I, I live in, uh, and work in Baton Rouge. Uh, and uh, I was uh, spared any uh, particular uh, uh, damage to my, uh, my house and to my family. Uh, however, uh, when you have 500 of your soldiers uh, that have been affected uh, as uh, catastrophically, uh, I, I have to tell you that I feel like I'm very much affected. Uh, it, it saddens me terribly. Uh, the, uh, it's just a terrible thing that they're going to come back from 18 months of sacrifice uh, where they have risked their lives and, uh, and have a, a disaster of this nature, uh, don't have a home to come back to. Uh, I appreciate the question in that the Army has uh, really, and, and the Department of Defense, stepped up uh, to provide an uh, unprecedented level of support and, uh, uh, to them. Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of uh, additional uh, benefits that are being laid out in the, as I mentioned, as a menu of, uh, of options that, that they can make a choice uh, there is uh, what is referred to as a Tiger Team. There's an active component of Brigadier General, uh, General Byrne, is over in Kuwait right now. Uh, as part of the out processing, uh, he is briefing uh, my soldiers on some of those uh, benefits that the Army is going to make available, uh, such as Safe Haven, where there's going to be some housing made available to them. Uh, there's a lot of details uh, to that uh, that have yet to be worked out, but um, uh, the Army is going to take care of its own, and I would tell you that Louisiana uh, does it as well as any state, and uh, we're going to get our arms around these soldiers and, and make sure that they're taken care of, and then we will take care of uh, uh, the rest of the population that is, uh, that is suffering. General Lolita Balador with AP. Can you tell us how many soldiers have already arrived in the United States and when you expect those in Kuwait to get here? Uh, there's about, uh, about 200 uh, that are on the ground uh, as we speak and uh, more flowing in, uh, as I say, by the hour. Uh, we do have the 500 uh, plus uh, most seriously affected uh, program for all of the earliest flights. And uh, by, th by the evening of the 10th, uh, Louisiana time, if, if all goes as planned, uh, we should have all of those soldiers back uh, in the United States. Uh, again, but right behind them are more flights of, uh, of uh, soldiers that will then uh, move to the demobilization process and then make their own choice about whether or not they're going to be able to uh, 
uh, continue to serve in a, in a recovery uh, capacity or just return back to their uh, civilian lives. But uh, we're going to get uh, those soldiers back the first. We're going to uh, provide them with the maximum amount of support. I think what you'll find is they'll be characterized by uh, 500 uh, individual situations that require an individual solution to each. Uh, some will require more services than others. Some have families uh, in Louisiana, uh, some do not. Uh, either way, we will come up with a plan and come up with uh, the support that they need uh, to help them get their lives uh, back together. Uh, hi, General. Jeff Shovel with Stars and Stripes. I just want to make sure I have the numbers correct. You said there are about 2,500 soldiers from the Louisiana National Guard in the brigade, of which an informal poll shows 800 are willing to be part of the disaster recovery efforts, and about 1,500 say they would, they're going home? That's correct. Uh, so the Louisiana National Guard, the unit coming back, hasn't been drafted into the effort. They, the soldiers themselves can decide whether they want to be part of the effort? That is correct. Speak as to why it seems like uh, two-thirds of the unit is going home and uh, one-third is going to the disaster relief. Again, what it represents is a, uh, an opportunity for those soldiers that have just spent 18 months uh, in preparation for and in combat uh, that they, uh, they can continue to serve. And in some cases, that's uh, a good thing for them in terms of their future employment. Uh, the other 1,500, uh, there's certainly uh, no negative connotation to uh, the choice that they might make about uh, returning back to their civilian lives. Uh, as National Guardsmen, uh, these soldiers uh, in many, many cases have come from small businesses, have come from uh, uh, work environments that have uh, literally hung on by their fingernails until these soldiers have returned. Uh, and so uh, they are not being pressed into service. I think what you see is, again, the National Guard family uh, with the leadership right from the national level, from the National Guard Bureau and the Army National Guard, has provided support from our fellow states, which is what we've done in the past when there's been uh, disasters in other states. Uh, we work as a national team, and, uh, and we are now in a position where we can rely on some others to assist us. They're there, they're available, and, uh, and so uh, having a choice, we believe, is uh, an appropriate uh, course of action here. General, this is Scott Foster with NBC. The soldiers who do decide to assist in recovery, are they going to stay on their active duty status or would they be transferred uh, to the control of the governor? Uh, the plan right now is for all them to uh, go to a Title 32 status. Uh, General, uh, an Iraq question. Uh, the 69th, uh, which is under your control, at one point had the airport road. Uh, is the airport road, Route Irish, still under your uh, oversight, um, or was it recently, and what's the status of the safety for uh, Iraqis and Americans using that road? Uh, yes, it was uh, under my control uh, up until recently when, uh, as we uh, did our uh, transfer of authority with other units and turned it over, and, and yes, the 69th uh, was uh, under my command and control, and they were the ones responsible for uh, its security. Uh, I think if you uh, check the record in terms of the uh, numbers of attacks, and if you would look at some of the improvements that have been made uh, to the physical uh, surroundings that, uh, in terms of the, the uh, interchanges and some of the checkpoints that we've put in have had a, an extremely beneficial uh, uh, effect on that road. And uh, attacks are down, and we also have a, another success story in that we've got uh, Iraqi special police who uh, during our period here we brought them into that fight and we now work shoulder to shoulder with them on that very very important uh, uh, main, main route. So uh, what you've seen since their arrival, the, the Iraqis and, uh, and the uh, additional uh, improvements that we've made to the road uh, during the period of time uh, that the 69th controlled it, uh, the uh, number of attacks have gone down, it's been uh, a safer uh, road. I believe that uh, uh, the, the, the significant activities and the attacks would prove that out as far as the numbers are concerned. One or two more. Um, Will, why don't you go ahead? General Will Dunham with Reuters again. Uh, just to return to an earlier question, when will the entirety of the unit uh, return home? Uh, and also, how much earlier than previously scheduled is the unit returning home? 
Well, the only thing that uh, that we're doing right now is tr we're, the Army and, and, uh, and everybody is trying to uh, uh, see what they can do to try to increase uh, the aircraft that can uh, uh, accelerate the, uh, the redeployment of, of the brigade. Uh, we have completely finished our mission, so it's not like we're leaving earlier in terms of what the tour required. Uh, the, the current plan for the flow uh, that was going back to Louisiana uh, was predicated basically on uh, the flow that would go through Fort Polk as we demobilized. Well, and that extended it out over a period of time uh, because there was only so much capacity there, and so it was a uh, much more relaxed uh, flow there. Uh, now, with these uh, circumstances, uh, what everybody is trying to do is to see uh, the extent to which we can make uh, uh, additional transportation available and, and speed the process up. I can't answer your question directly because all of the efforts are underway right now, and uh, to the extent that they're successful, we may be back sooner. Uh, as of right now, if we were to just stay on plan, uh, the entire brigade, uh, well, the vast majority of the brigade, uh, would be home uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of the, uh, the 20th of September. Uh, I have to uh, mention that there's a, a small group of about 200 uh, that is in the trail party. Uh, these are soldiers that are going to remain in Kuwait that are responsible for loading the ship and uh, ensuring that all of our equipment gets back to Louisiana. Uh, that's all part of the plan, no different. Uh, those soldiers, uh, every one of them, have been carefully selected uh, to ensure that they don't have any, uh, that they can serve uh, on that extended type of, uh, of, a, of an assignment uh, without any negative effects uh, based on the hurricane or, or their personal lives. Uh, so uh, they're set uh, to do that, but uh, the vast majority of the brigade uh, should be back uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of the 20th to the 23rd. Uh, we're hopeful that perhaps we can get back a little sooner if the, uh, if the aircraft can be made available. General, I think we'll bring this to a close. Again, uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of everybody here for, for taking some time today and, uh, and uh, congratulate you for a mission well done over the last 12 months. And uh, I know that we all wish you and your men the best as you return back to Louisiana uh, to what is uh, undoubtedly a difficult situation for many of your soldiers. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, chat with you this morning uh, about the unit and the good work that those soldiers did. They're great Americans. And, uh, and I would just uh, say to the uh, citizens of Louisiana and Mississippi and the affected region, our prayers are with you, and, and we'll be home soon. Thank you, General. Thank you.